The scripture today is the 23rd Psalm. I'll be reading from the um, English Standard Version. If you'll allow me just a a short personal aside. Where are you, Tim? Uh, This Psalm, a lot of times in the Marine Corps, gave me a lot of comfort. Remember it. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They prepare a table, or you prepare a table before me, In the presence of mine enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Be seated. Well, I'm certainly delighted to be with you today, and I'm very grateful for the presence of each and every one, and for the beautiful singing and the very fervent prayers, and those who've led us in our worship, we're very grateful. Thank you for that, and thank you for your attendance today. As you notice in our bulletin, we've given special attention to our graduating seniors uh, this morning, and a special service tonight. Uh, Our young people are going to be leading and directing our worship service tonight. I hope you'll be here and be a part of that tonight at six o'clock and make sure you get a copy of the bulletin because I think as you see um, our seniors as they always do have really established themselves in such a remarkable way and read the biographical sketches of each of them please and and uh, say hello to them and be encouraging of them as they have made this milestone accomplished so much uh, remarkable group of young men and women. I have to say, such a fine, handsome group of young people. I hope that you'll uh, take notice of that and congratulate them. Uh, They've uh, established themselves academically, and more important than that, in in living godly lives. And so I would surely uh, commend them to you and take a moment and say hello to them and then be back with us tonight at 6 o'clock where Nat and, and our young people will be conducting our worship service. We're happy to do that. I'm talking today about the grace of giving, Psalm 23, and if you're thinking about, well, how much do I give in the contribution? Yeah, I'm thinking about that. And if you're thinking about, well, how much am I giving myself to the work of the Lord? Yeah, I'm thinking about that. And how much can I give as far as a young person in my life to God? I'm thinking about that. And I hope that you'll think about that. And I'll tell you what, I'm always thinking about one person in particular, and that's me. And if any of this applies to anyone, it certainly applies to me. If any is needed by anyone, it certainly is needed by me. And so I'm not necessarily singling anyone out as I am singling myself out, that I'm the one that needs to listen to these great truths of God's Word and apply them more appropriately to my life. I just wonder what really motivates us to give. Uh, What is it that makes us give? Or the kind of people, the kind of givers that we really are. Are we the constant taker, taker, taker? Or are we cultivating the fine art and the grace of giving? And I thought of this great passage in Psalm 23, which is perhaps the most popular passage in all the Bible. I'm sure it's the most popular Old Testament passage, maybe of all the Bible, Old or New Testament, a passage about giving. I want to notice, and thank you, Perry, for reading this for us, but I want to notice just a point or two about how much God gives in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, I've often thought of this in the wrong light. I've often thought about just a young boy out on the Judean hillsides tending the sheep and then writing a psalm. But I I've changed my thought on that. I think what you have here is a king, a king who's writing about those days when he was out there on the hillsides tending the flocks and taking care of the herds. And he says, I got a, I got a shepherd. 
I'm the shepherd of Israel, king of Israel, but I've got to shepherd myself. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You see how God provides? God gives to me. He restores my soul. You know, when I'm really down and out and I have real problems of life, he's the guide and he's the direction of my life. You see how God gives to the whole person. He gives physically, verse 1. He's giving mentally and spiritually, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, The protection that God provides. Isn't this a wonderful statement? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they they comfort me. The wonderful deliverance that God gives. He now switches from the shepherd scene to the banquet scene, and he talks about God giving there, a wonderful banquet. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Look how God gives. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs or overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a beautiful psalm talking about God giving and giving and giving, and you begin to ask the question, you know, what really has made me the kind of person that I am? Uh, What has made me the kind of person? Am I the person who always wants to receive, 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 or am I a person who's also been taught to give? Because God is a great giver. Now, there are a lot of wonderful references and phrases in this passage. I'm in Psalm 23, and I'm looking at one of the great Old Testament passages of the Bible, maybe one of the greatest of all the Bible. And in this psalm, there are all kinds of phrases, all kinds of words that I love to talk about. But I want to focus on this one, which I really think captures the idea of God giving like he has. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's verse 5. You anoint my head with oil, and here it is. My cup overflows. Now, he didn't say we had a cup. He didn't say something was in the cup. God gave you something that he put in the cup. He didn't say the cup was filled up. He says the cup continues to overflow and overflow and overflow. God is a giver. He gives, and He gives, and He gives. He gives in such abundant fashion that the Hebrew writer would have to say, my cup flows over and over and over. It never does run dry because God gives, and He gives. And I think about myself. What kind of person am I with regard to my giver? Now, let me pause for a moment here. Every Christian person has an obligation, responsibility to give. When we became children of God by obedience to the gospel of Christ, we repented of our sins and we confessed our faith in Jesus Christ and we were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 verse 38 as the Bible teaches. We became Christian people. We're now following the Lord. We have responsibility to give. New Testament passages, great passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2, and and in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, passages that ought to be marked in every Christian's Bible, emphasizing the need for Christian people to give. And in those passages, he's talking about the giving of our financial means to the work of the Lord. And some Christian people really Take that to heart. I've seen some people give and give and give as children of God. And they've really learned the lesson of giving, the grace of giving. And it's amazing to me how much they give and how willing they are. And then there are some who see the need to give, but they're not as good as they ought to be in this wonderful opportunity. And they don't really give as they've been prospered, but they will. They will give. They uh, their, their understanding of the Bible's teaching regarding the matter, and from time to time they give. And then there are some who are Christian people who just don't care. And they're not spiritually attuned to the matter of giving as they should be, and they just don't give like they've been prospered, and they really don't care. And I think that I'd have to divide this into two categories of people, just from my own mindset and from my own understanding about the matter, you know, there are some people that just haven't been taught, and they just don't know. 
They don't know the significance of it, and they don't know the importance of it. And I guess we've all been there from time to time about something. We've learned better later, and we've improved our lives spiritually. We just didn't know. We, we just didn't understand. And there are groups of people that fall into that type of category whereby we just didn't know any better, but now we've learned better, and we're going to try to do better. And then there's a second group of person that just doesn't care. He doesn't care about being faithful to God, doesn't care about giving of his means or giving of his talent or giving of his time or giving of his life. He doesn't care. He feels like his means are all his own, his time's all his own, his life's all his own. And why should I give to God anything? And if you walked up to this person, you say, look, I want to help you understand something here. You need to do better about giving. And it may be we're talking about financial means, but not just that. Uh, You need to do more with regard to your abilities. You have such abilities. You need to be giving more with regard to your ability. Or you have such time. Now's a good time for you to be giving of yourself to God, giving of yourself to the church of the living God. And you know what? Generally, that does not work well. You know what, generally I found that when you walk up and you start talking to somebody about the need to improve their life in that regard with the matter of giving, it just doesn't seem to work very well. They may be somewhat resistant to that. And when you walk up to them and start talking to them about their need to give more of their life and more of their time and more of their attention to the church of the living God and the Lord who died for them and was raised from the dead, they might even become resentful. Well, why are you coming to me telling me about that? So I asked myself the question, what's the best way to motivate to give more and to learn more about the grace of giving? What can motivate us? To understand how important it is to really give. And I, again, if you're thinking I'm talking about financial means, yeah, I'm talking about that. If you think, well, I'm talking about my talent and my abilities, yeah, you're right, I'm talking about that. Time for you to step up in your responsibilities to serve the Lord, you're right, I've got that in mind. Talking about a special person, you're right about that again too. I got this guy right here in my mind. About how it's important for me to stand up What can motivate me? What can reach down into the inner part of my life and the inner part of my being and motivate me to be a giver? Not to always be on the receiving end, but to recognize my responsibility before God and to give. And there's a general principle that comes up with this particular matter that I think will help us get started. And this is it. When somebody does so much good to us, we naturally would want to turn around and do good for them. And it's just a general principle. Generally, when people are so good to us, then we're naturally the kind of person that wants to reciprocate and be the kind of person that is good to them. It's a good starting place, isn't it? For us to consider this matter of my cup is running over. God keeps giving and giving and giving. And now I'm going to be motivated to give more to God and to the work of God. And I'll grow in my understanding. And I'll grow in my appreciation. And I'll grow in my thankfulness that God has given me so much. Shouldn't I give back to God? Here's a Bible passage or two that I think will help us understand the biblical principle which this Old Testament writer gave us. My cup runs over. It's not that I have a cup. My cup just keeps running over and over and over. Psalm 145 and 9. And also included for us on our consideration, verse 16. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. Perhaps you've never read it. I love the study of the Psalms. I love going back and looking at these Old Testament passages. And I can see myself mirrored in them. In that I need to learn this. In that I need to improve myself. In that I need to be doing better compared to what I'm reading here. And in this particular passage, Psalm 145, he's talking about how great God is. 
And this has got to be a motivational passage. You notice in verse 9, The Lord is good to all, and His mercy is over all He has made. Isn't that a wonderful thought? The Lord is good to all. But I tell you what really impressed me when I got through this, and I was working my way through Psalm 145, verse 16. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Bible passage is Psalm 145. It is verse 16. It's a verse you can read from the pages of your own Bible. I hope you'll mark it and reflect on that particular matter. God opens up his hand and he satisfies the desire of every living thing as his creation. Now this is what we call anthropomorphic language. That's a rather large word, isn't it? The scholars like to use words like this, and anthropomorphism is an idea of speaking of God in human terms. It's not that God literally has a hand. It's not that God literally has a hand that he opens up and blessings just spill out upon every living thing. But he's trying to put it in human language so that we can understand the great mercy and love of God. The benevolent heart of God is a giver. And he's saying, now here's a way for us to understand and be motivated by the fact that we need to be better givers of our life, of our time, our talent, our resources. God opens up his hand. And he satisfies the need of everything. Whether it be the sparrow, or whether it be you, or whether it be me, God opens up and he gives. I thought of this passage in Luke chapter 6, and it takes a little explanation to understand the context of the matter and, and the situation in which it is found. He has this wonderful verse about God being the giver. Judge not, verse 37, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And here's the verse, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, once again, it's chapter 6. It's verse 38. And it's a Bible passage that really takes a piece of culture in it and helps us understand something of the great giving of God. Now, the point that he's making is that the public weights and measures, one would not be given a cheap, scanty measure with regard to the produce that you purchase, but you'd be given a full measure. If you bought a pound, it'd be a full pound. Um, in a biblical context, they wore the, the robes, you see, and they would open the upper portion of their robes. And if you bought rye or wheat or figs or whatever it be, they would pour it into that fold of the robe and, and you would carry it that way. It sort of serves as a pocket on a jacket or a pocket on our trousers they would use their robe in that fashion. They carried the produce home with them. And Jesus said, be given into your lap. It'd be a full measure, pressed down, given into your lap. Given it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now I'm more motiva motivated to give, you see, because I see what kind of giver God really is. And I, I thought of this verse in our Bibles, James chapter 1. Especially as a young person going through school and, and uh, thinking about the future and graduating from high school, what a great accomplishment that is. And we're all very proud of you in that regard. But I hope that you'll never forget this particular passage of Scripture. It comes to us in James chapter 1 and verse 17. And it, it's another good one to remember, verse 17. Mark it in the pages of your Bible and never forget it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The Bible passage is James 1, and the verse is verse 17. And every good and perfect gift that we receive comes from God above, and He's given us these wonderful matters and they are blessings 
rather than us just take them in and absorb them and accumulate them, let us think about our responsibility to give. And even though God has given so much to me, and He's opened up His hand, and, and, and He's satisfied the need of every living thing, and, and God has been so good to us, does that not motivate me to develop the quality and the grace of giving back? rather than just always receiving. Now, I'm not finished with that point. I want to learn to be a better giver. And so I'm going to speak a little more specifically about how God gives. And you may come to think, well, I knew that already. Yes, I know that. But perhaps we have forgotten it. And we've taken it for granted. And surely, by understanding these particular matters more specifically, I'll become a better giver of my life and be helpful toward others, being obedient to God Almighty. How does God give? He gives life. What a gift. Every life, every human being, is intrinsically important because life is a gift from God. And it's something that I suppose we take for granted. And I hope I am not offensive in this, but I feel strongly about this. The stupidest thing I've ever heard is that man is the result of millions of years of gradual mindless development. God is the giver of life and never get the idea that we created ourselves or that we were somehow spontaneously developing from a lower form of life to a higher form of life. That doesn't happen. The species has a wonderful way of survival and it has built within it a wonderful way of fine-tuning the species, but that's as far as it goes. This bird developed a harder bill in order to eat the nut or the fruit and survived. And he evolved a harder bill than the soft-billed bird, and he was able to survive because of it. And it's a wonderful way to fine-tune the species, but that's as far as it's going to be able to go. It's not going to transcend that species and create a new species of life. It can't happen. It can't happen. Sir Frederick Hoyle, the origin of life, mathematically speaking, just could not have just happened. And then for emphasis, he says, it can't happen. Hoyle's an amazing scientist, was, of course, honored by the Queen of England because of his work in this particular matter. And if Hoyle, not what I would call a Christian person at all, but Hoyle certainly sees it just can't happen by mind's ceaseless chance. Let's say um, we got the cotton bowl full of, uh, full of people. 92,000, 93,000 up there in Dallas. reason I picked out the Cotton Bowl, because that's where the Cowboys used to play. Now it's AT&T Stadium, and the Cotton Bowl Classics now at AT&T Stadium. Used to be in the Cotton Bowl there at the fairgrounds in Dallas. Let's say about 93,000 people. Full of people, every one of them. Every one of them blind. And every one of them given a Rubik's Cube. And every one of them simultaneously solving that puzzle. It's not going to happen. That basically is what you have with regard to organic evolution. The kind of evolution that says that life evolved from a lower form of life to a higher form of life through change. Now, all of us understand and embrace change within the species, but to actually say it creates new life, 
That's not going to happen. It's never happened. The scientist wants to put a mathematical, statistical relationship to that. They want to see everything statistically related. It's a one in a thousand chance, or one chance in a hundred thousand, or one chance in a hundred million, or one chance in a hundred billion. And they say, you see, there's just no way it could happen because you got only one chance of it happening in a hundred billion. And I think Hoyle is right. There's no way it's going to happen. It's not one in a hundred billion. It's none at all. It couldn't happen because God is the giver of all life. And you find this point made for us in Acts chapter 17, the pages of the Bible. God gives life. And Paul in Acts chapter 17 is talking to the intellectual people of his day in the city of Athens and, he, and he's moved by the idolatry of the people and the statues that they've created. And he comes up in a place called the Areopagus. Uh, it was a place where free speech was allowed, and he's able to get up. He takes his turn. He says, now, I really see that you're very religious type of people, and I, I want to talk to you about the one God you've left out. I see you have an image here to the unknown God. So superstitious. They were afraid they'd left one of the gods out, so they erected an altar to the unknown God. You can read about this in Acts chapter 17. And in this particular passage, he says, now that's the God, that unknown God that I want to tell you about. He's the one that's given to all life and breath and all things. He gave us life. Nor is he served by human hands, verse 25, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God's a giver. And God has given us and given to us and given to us. And he's given us life. Do you know the human being breathes 15 times every minute? You ever stop to thank God for breath and for the air we breathe? 900 times an hour. Just stop one time and you'll find the difference in that. If we can't breathe that one time, you're going to find it out. 21,600 times per day, God gives us breath to breathe, life, lungs, heart, mind, and brain to absorb these particular elements of our world. How did we get that? God gave us that. Have you ever stopped to thank God for what He's given you? You see, that motivates me to become a better giver. Now I'm going to give better because I know God's given so much to me. He's given me life. And He gives me breath. He gives me the oxygen to breathe. Now when you graduate from school, what a great accomplishment that is. Just remember, I'm thankful to God. And now I have responsibility to give back. God in this regard not only gives us life, but he sustains us. And I think we need to spend just a few brief moments about that. Because the Bible is very clear that God did not just create the world and leave it, but God sustains the world in which we live. And there are two passages I always like to go to to see this truth. And that's in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 is the first one that I'll make mention to you. He's talking about the greatness of Christ and the importance of Christ. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. You see that in verse 3. He holds the world together. Not only did he create the world and all that is in the world, but he also holds the world together. He sustains the world. He takes care of the world. Paul, in talking about the greatness of Christ, makes reference to this work of Christ in Colossians chapter 1. And it becomes one of the central focus points of the book of Colossians a prison epistle written in the second half of the first century, and he talks about this matter and the work of Christ. He's the image of the invisible God, verse 15. The firstborn of all creation. That's his rank. He is over all, you see. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And I always thought the prepositions used there very enlightening. 
And he is before all things, verse 17, and in him all things hold together. He sustains the world in which we live. Not only did he create it, and Paul makes the point very clearly that he did, but he's also making the point very clear. He holds it together. And I'm thankful for what God does and how God gives and He gives and He gives. The Apostle Paul's on his first missionary journey. There were three, you know. In Acts chapter 14, he talks about, Luke does, the events that took place in the city of Lystra, an ancient city. And that's a remarkable story. I wish I had time to talk about Lystra and its location and what all happened there. There are a lot of very consequential things happened at Lystra on the first missionary journey and as Paul comes back on the second. But they worship him as a god, and he stops them. He says, no, don't do this, and he begins to tell them who the real god is. And he tells them in Acts chapter 14 about verse 17, and that's where we come in in our study. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. There's plenty of evidence there to prove God. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Look how God gives. Uh, we have rain out there today, and we're thankful that God has given us the rain. There are days when God gives us the sun, and we receive the energy from the sun. All of these, the biblical text is telling us, is evidence and proof of God as a great giver. If I were to turn to John chapter 3, verse 16, you'd see immediately how God gives. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. The greatest being gave the greatest gift, and that's his son. But turn with me to another Bible passage perhaps you hadn't thought about. It's in Galatians chapter 1. And in Galatians chapter 1, it also talks about how great God is as a giver. He sustains the world. And how that he's given us his son, the greatest of gifts, so that we would receive forgiveness of sin. What a wonderful gift God has given I'm in Galatians 1, it's beginning in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch it. Watch it. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. The Bible passage is Galatians 1. And particularly it is verse 4. And it's a Bible passage that says God is a great giver. And he gave his son so that I could be delivered from sin and this present evil age. If you took a book, a ledger book, and just write all your sins down there. All the bad circumstances, all the sins. Did I say book? I guess I should have said library. That would include all my sins. God's forgiven every one of them. And I put all those sins down in that library about Jim. And all the wrong things he said and all the wrong things he did and all the wrong things he thought about. God gave his son so that Jim could receive forgiveness of sin and be delivered from this present evil age. I want to tell you something about that right now. The psychologist will try to inform you that guilt is a bad thing and that you ought to feel good about yourself. And the Bible teaches that we can feel good about ourselves if we will learn from the guilt. Jesus is talking about that in Matthew chapter 5 and 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn over what? The guilt of their sin. When you get the guilt out of your life, then you can receive comfort. You can't get the guilt out of your life just by forgetting about it or just by masking it and feeling good about yourself. His point here in Galatians chapter 1, he gave his son so that we can really feel good about ourselves and get rid of the guilt of sin which burdens us down. He's a giver and only God could do that. And when I see what a great giver God is, I learn to be a giver. 
I learned to be a giver in my financial abilities and means. I learned to be a great giver with regard to my life. I learned to be a great giver with regard to my time and my talents. And it's not always just me, 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 receiving, receiving, receiving. But now I've learned the nature of God is to give. And I contemplate that wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. And I start to appreciate I need to be a giver. I'm not just always receiving. But I want to talk about another point that's very near and dear to us here at Broadway and near and dear to my heart and I'm sure to yours as well. And that's God gives eternal life, doesn't he? God gives life unending. The ancients could not conceive of eternal life. And so they would write about it in terms of ages to come, an eternal life, eternal time. And we as modern people can't really conceive of everlasting life. We think about it from the standpoint of here's a new age and when we finish that we have another age and another one after that and another one after that and it is eternity. And it's hard for us really to get a handle on what eternity really means and we do the very best that we can But I believe in eternal life. And I believe that every individual can have it if they will turn out of obedient faith to God and to Jesus Christ. Because God gives it. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Verse 3, God has prepared a place for everyone who will, out of obedient faith, give of themselves to God by repenting of their sins and confessing their faith in Christ and by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and living the faithful Christian life, dedicating themselves to giving their life to God. Let me tell you something. We spend our lives and we're using them up. Our lives are running down and we only have a small portion of life. How are we going to use it? The Bible is telling us, use it for an understanding of the will of God for your life and put that in your life, implement that into your life. Do God's will. An integral part of doing that is giving. Giving of my means, yeah, that's included. Giving of my time, that's right giving of my abilities to others, to the church, of the living God, absolutely. Giving my life to God, absolutely. That's what it means to become a Christian. I have this exercise for you this week. If you'll do it, it'll change your life. Put the microscope on your life and count your blessings. Count every one of them. Just kind of think about it. God's blessed me with this. God's blessed me with that. God's given me this. God's given me that. And all the blessings. And you soon realize my cup runs over. Do that as a daily exercise this week. And you'll become more faithful and more dedicated in being a giver and being more like God who gives and gives and gives. Rather than having the selfish ambition of it being me and me and me. Now, by an understanding of the Word of God and the nature of God Himself, I have a better understanding of what God is like. Integral to the nature of God is that He gives. And I want to be more like Him. Now, I can't outgive God. God has given me so much, I cannot do it. I, I can't so give of my life and my time and my talents. 
I'm not trying to earn my salvation here. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to give back. And I know I can't give back all that God has given to me. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try. I'm going to try to give back like he has given to me. And I know I can't do it. I know I can't give like he's given. But I'm going to try. And I know that I still need the grace of God and the mercy of God. And I plead for God's mercy and I plead for God's grace. Please forgive me, Lord, as I repent of those sins and I become more like your son through obedient faith. But I'm going to do my best to give my life, my time, my talent, and my means. And that starts with you becoming a child of God and becoming a Christian as I've very briefly outlined it for you. And I urge you to do that now. Won't you come while together we stand and while we sing?